Hold on to your beanies, please. He was the mastermind behind the biggest retail fraud in U.S. history. He was very, very sharp. He was very, very shrewd. And used techniques investigators had never seen before. He had more fires and floods than the Bible. He had a genius tricks in order to defraud investors. He was such a larger-than-life Brooklyn Fonz that he fooled Wall Street into thinking that they were fooling him. And vanished with hundreds of millions of dollars. Find out how he did it next on Masterminds. Wall Street, the epicenter of high finance. The place where private businesses raise millions to expand their operations. In 1984, investment firms fought to take a chain of electronics stores called Crazy Eddie public. It was one of the hottest IPOs in Wall Street history. And the stock went up like a rocket. Just the stock went public at $8 a share split adjusted it went to an equivalent of eighty dollars a share investors scrambled for a piece of the company that had revolutionized the electronics business crazy eddie was the father of the retail electronics chains that they didn't exist prior to, to crazy eddie stores instead of selling home electronics in stuffy department stores Crazy Eddie used the capital it raised to offer discounted merchandise in a party atmosphere. Hold on to your beanies. Crazy Eddie's coming to Princeton. And created the most relentless ad campaign New York had ever seen. It's Crazy Eddie's greatest TV and video sale ever. Between this visionary promotion and the great deals in the stores, Crazy Eddie became a household name. So get anything and everything in TV and video. Get it now during Crazy Eddie's greatest TV and video sale ever. They were the electronics store. That was where you went to get your great deal. Crazy Eddie had better name recognition than Coca-Cola. The chain crushed the competition. Its market dominance became unstoppable. Come again to Crazy Eddie's. Crazy Eddie's. Thank you, sir. Go get the best price you can find and then come to Crazy Eddie's and we'll beat it. Crazy Eddie expanded at a phenomenal rate. What began as a single outlet in Brooklyn had by 1987 grown into a vast empire of 39 superstores that employed more than 2,000 people. At the zenith, the company was the largest electronics retailer in the tri-state area. The insatiable appetite for Crazy Eddie's deals drove the stock price ever higher. Its eventual market capitalization at its peak was over $600 million. But what nobody knew was... Insane! The Crazy Eddie empire was a massive fraud. Crazy Eddie brought this company public to defraud the public. There's no doubt in my mind at all. The company's founder, Eddie Antar, had done a lot more than just cook the books. He employed an amazing array of techniques never seen before and lined his pockets with over $200 million in cash. The question is, how did he do it? Eddie Antar is the mastermind behind the Crazy Eddie Empire and the greatest retail fraud in American history. Antar was born into a tight-knit family of merchants from low-rent Brooklyn. Eddie learned literally uh, on his father's knee to be a swindler. His father and some of their other family members routinely would take home cash from his discount retailing business and basically divvy it up among themselves. But Eddie's dreams are bigger. By his early teens, he's hawking cheap consumer goods obtained through shady connections. He's barely 20 when he marries his high school sweetheart, Debbie Rosen, 
and opens his first Crazy Eddie store. Eddie had the ambition, the drive, the vision of making the big time. You see, Eddie didn't want to be a neighborhood guy. He wanted to be world famous. Eddie was a great salesman, but better than that, he was very, very sharp. He was very, very shrewd. He was pretty much considered the early master of the bait and switch. Where he'd get a customer in and uh, trying to buy a $99 piece of merchandise, and he'd sell them for $4.99. He said, people want hope and dreams. We'll sell them hope and dreams. Right from the start, he skims money. There was a culture that said, the tax man does not deserve to have any of our money. Eddie would skim off all of the cash sales of the business so they wouldn't have to report those as taxable income. Eddie then hires trusted family members and pays them off the books to further avoid taxes and scrutiny. Crazy Eddie thrives. But manufacturers start withholding stock because Eddie sells below their list price. Faced with empty shelves, he fights back. Eddie said, I don't care if I have to get the goods out of Canada or Europe or Africa. He survives by sidestepping manufacturers and obtaining merchandise through family connections to the underground market. He broke their hold on the price fixing. And that was his claim that he was the champion of the New York electronics consumer. Eddie also uses these underground connections for cornering the market on the next big thing. He knew the Walkman was a winner. He had shiploads of Walkmans on the water. Uh, by the time other people were looking to buy them and you couldn't buy them in quantity. Eddie now opens two new stores and hires close relatives as managers, allowing skimming to continue and reaping hundreds of thousands of dollars. But to Eddie, this is small change. He sets about to increase his take by millions. If you're a retailer, the biggest single asset you usually have is inventory. And so if you can falsely claim inventory that you don't have, that boosts your assets. Eddie bought used and damaged merchandise and sold it as new. That used television is now in a heat-sealed plastic bag. It looks fine. Eddie also commits extensive insurance fraud. Eddie had more fires and floods than the Bible. He convinces insurance adjusters that stacks of empty boxes contain damaged merchandise and collects hundreds of thousands of dollars on phony claims. But with his business expanding, Antar knows he risks becoming the target of surprise visits from financial auditors. Now, when the auditor wanted to go out and see the inventory, OK, what do we do? Our count sheets show us that X, our inventory, is at Y. We have a problem. His solution is to plant a spy inside the company that audits Crazy Eddie. He sends his cousin Sam to accounting school for an all-expenses-paid education. That brought great loyalty to Eddie. And when Eddie would say jump, I would say how high. So Sammy went off to college, got an accounting degree, went to work for the CPA firm that actually audited Crazy Eddie's, learned how audits were conducted so that he would know where the holes were. With Sam placed on the inside, Eddie's confidence grows. By 1978, Eddie and his family are skimming $1 for every five they bring in, reaping millions. The skimming was, was handled now as a, like just as a division within the company. It became institutionalized within the company. 
But Eddie is running out of places to hide his cash. There's millions in safe deposit boxes, in the bedrooms, in the houses. There's millions in the ceilings. He solves that problem by taking monthly trips to Tel Aviv and depositing his money in numerous secret bank accounts. I've seen deposit slips of a million dollars at a time. I've seen bank balances totaling over six million dollars. As his illegal profits skyrocket, Eddie employs his wife and family as couriers. They transport over 11 million dollars to his Tel Aviv accounts. While they do the dirty work, Eddie dreams of greater glory. He's looking to be a star, and he's not a star yet. Donald Trump is bigger than him. So how do you make it? You go public. He saw taking the company public as his brass ring. You can do much better with phony income in a public company than you can in a private company because other people are buying your stock. But before Antar can approach Wall Street, his company must first undergo a thorough financial audit. He calls on his spy, Sam, who arranges for an inexperienced auditor to be assigned the job. The naive rookie is greeted at the front of the store. At the back, Antar's staff piles up masses of inventory shipped over from other stores. Antar shows the auditor an example of the merchandise he has come to tally. Then a helpful employee is sent up to count the stacks. She would call down 70 large screen TVs. And if you looked at that row as the auditor from the ground, you could count 70 boxes. You could see how many there were across and how many there were down but the entire stack is little more than a facade. The auditor dutifully records the inflated numbers he is given. Antar goes further when he distracts the auditor and alters his inventory tallies right on the count sheets. He would take every one and make it a four or a seven and then give them back their altered papers. And so where they had written down 10, it was now either 40 or 70. Even better, the files give Eddie crucial information about the next stores the auditor plans to visit and the sample counts he intends to take. So that night, they had these poor guys loading up the truck again and driving to store B. And they just kept a step ahead of the auditors in, in doing that. The auditor paints a portrait of a thriving company. Eddie Antar is now ready to strike. Armed with 13 apparently successful stores, he sits down to seal the deal with Wall Street. Here were the investment professionals, the Wall Street sharks, thinking they were cleaning up these dumb Brooklyn street guys. And the supposedly dumb Brooklyn street guys are playing them. He was such a larger-than-life Brooklyn funds that he fooled the crooks on Wall Street into thinking that they were fooling him. With the money he rakes in going public, Antar opens 26 new stores in under three years and quietly cashes out $40 million worth of his own shares. At the annual Crazy Eddie shareholder meeting, he is greeted like a rock star. Eddie came and did the rocky, you know, hands over his head, and the crowd started chanting, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. And at that moment, Eddie Antar was as happy as he ever was in his entire life. But what Eddie doesn't realize is the magnitude of his success. 
threatens to bring his vast empire crashing down. Hold on to your beanie. He's crazy and he's coming to Princeton, New Jersey with his greatest man opening frat party ever. Crazy and he's coming to 21 under Route 38 in the Cherry Hill Shopping Center. Crazy and he's coming to 150 Broadway, corner of Liberty Street, Manhattan. Be there. Crazy Eddie Antar, the darling of Wall Street is using the 39 stores in his three-state empire to line his pockets with millions. Crazy Eddie's, thank you. Insane. But now, he's got a problem. You have to feed the beast more each year. It's one thing to tell the auditors on the ground there's 70 TVs, but he can't tell them there's 7,000. They weren't making money, they were losing it. And so this has a cumulative effect. If you lose money in one year, then you essentially have to double down every year, and the fraud has to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The stress starts wreaking havoc in his family life. Antar fights with his wife, Debbie, and takes up with a mistress, also called Debbie. It was like trading in your car. Besides the same name, they looked very similar, except that uh, Debbie, too, was the younger, sleeker version. On New Year's Eve, 1984, Antar's wife catches him cheating with Debbie, too, when she is led right up to his car by Antar's sister. The incident causes a rift in the Antar clan. And that eventually led to the downfall of the family. You, you have to make the mafia comparison. They are united in their joint effort to make as much money as they can. And if they turn on one another, the game's over. With his family life in tatters, Eddie's business problems now worsen. The gap between what they were taking in and what they were called on to report by virtue of the fraud they had committed uh, was becoming just unbridgeable. The discovery of this kind of fraud was inevitable, and Sam E. knew it and feared it. Eddie acts quickly, cashing out another $30 million of stock before the price crashes. And people said, that doesn't sound very encouraging. The founder, the namesake, of the company is reducing his position. And so people started looking, and they found discrepancies. When they found discrepancies, they started talking to the SEC. New faces and new hands came in there, and new eyes. It was no longer this tight, inner-knit circle that he could control, but there were people there that he could not control, and it wouldn't take long for it to unravel. A business rival soon moves in and buys Crazy Eddie in a hostile takeover bid. But Antar has the last laugh. The new owner quickly discovers the inventory fraud, a staggering $80 million worth of non-existent merchandise. It was basically a, a hollowed out shell by that time and that it had largely been looted by Eddie. Before police can arrest Eddie on a racketeering charge, he flees to Israel, armed with six passports and access to his stolen millions. Sam is left holding the bag. And I said, fine, if I'm on my own, I'm on my own. And I decided to come clean. With the knowledge gained from Sam, Authorities launch an international manhunt for Antar, whose new life on the run is not working out the way he had hoped. You have to think of how big his need was to be noticed, to be admired, to get attention, all of which is completely inconsistent with going underground. There's no flashy sports cars, there's no flashy women. He couldn't live that way. Authorities get their break two years later, when Eddie, needing money, comes to Geneva and attempts to withdraw funds from one of his secret accounts. 
to his surprise, he learns that the account has been frozen. I think there was about $40 million in that account. And Eddie evidently was not happy that it was frozen. Eddie's attempts to recover the money fail. He leaves empty-handed. But the Swiss contact American law enforcement, who trace his steps back to Israel. He was caught when he left the apartment, and he started driving, and they had a female police officer who was wearing a micro mini dress and no underwear and bent over the hood of the car, exposing herself, knowing Eddie couldn't resist. He stopped, he got out, he patted her on the ass, said, that's a great ass. And she said, you're under arrest <laughs> and handcuffed him. <laughs> Jailed in Israel, Eddie Antar loses his fight to avoid extradition and is sent back to America to face justice. Eventually, Antar admits to 17 counts of fraud. He owes $150 million in fines and restitution and close to $1 billion in civil lawsuits. He goes to prison for eight years. We heard investors, we heard creditors, we hurt consumers that might have lost their refunds. We hurt the people that work for us that lost their jobs. There are countless other people who got hurt directly or indirectly from the frauds that we committed. You have to think of it as the Sephardic Jewish goodfellas. There were a pack of thieves. The whole family was a pack of thieves. And uh, there's no honor among thieves. Eddie could have been uh, an extremely successful businessman uh, who could have gone on to even bigger things. Eddie was like a force of nature, but like a tornado, when it was over, there was nothing but wreckage left.